First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Taz Car Insurance. How can I help you? Hello. I was wondering if you could give me a quote for my car, please. I'd like to insure it for a period of 12 months. Certainly. I need to take down a few details first of all. Can I have your name, please? Certainly. It's James Bartolo. Sorry. Can you say that again, please? Sure. James Bartolo. That's B-A-R-T-O-L-O. OK, thanks. And your date of birth? It's the 1st of the 8th, 1973. Great. And can you give me your address, please? Sure. It's 146 Eastern Road, Chester. Fabulous. Now, is the insurance for just yourself? No. Actually, my wife drives the car, too. Her name is Alice Jackson, and her date of birth is the 23rd of the 4th, 1968. That's OK. I just need to write yes or no and the make and model of the car you wish to insure. It's a 1998 Ford Laser. OK. And do you have any idea of the value of the car? Yes, it's around £4,000. I only bought it about a week ago. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. And do either you or your wife have any previous convictions or disqualifications? I'm sorry we have to ask this question, but of course it affects the price of the insurance cover. Not a problem. No, actually we both have clean driving licences. Nothing so far, touch wood. Good. So I can write none for that question. Now, who were you previously insured with? Uh, with Aitken Insurance. I'm sorry, could you spell that? Yes, it's A-I-T-K-E-N. I actually have a three years no claims bonus too. Great. That will bring the price down a little for you too. OK, if you just give me a few minutes, I'll work out a price for you now. That looks like it will be £275 per year. That sounds good to me. Can I pay for that now over the telephone? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. 
Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometers to 35 kilometers from the city center, or by car, 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, we cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. This is not to be confused with the coffee house, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the chocolate company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the fresh produce shop. A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat. So the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear the rest of the talk about family history. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, that's a few ideas about getting information, but what about methods of recording it? Of course, you can just write down what family members say, but it's even better if you can use a tape, so that you can record them as they're talking. Then you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes. You'll always be able to listen to it again. But whatever method you do use to record information, Remember that it's very important to make a note of exactly how you got it. So, if you are using tape, always start the recording by saying the date and the place, as well as the name of the person you're interviewing. So, apart from people's memories, where else can you find information? Well, there are all sorts of documents, and they can be extremely useful. People keep lots of kinds of documents in the home, like uh, photos or letters or diaries or birth certificates. And some people keep things from newspapers, like obituaries. Obituaries are announcements of a person's death, and they usually contain a lot of detail about that individual, like address, occupation, date of death, as well as the names and ages of the widow or widower and the dead person's children. So, be creative. Look around your home or the home of your relatives for any items that might contain clues, such as these about your family history. OK? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, you'll find that you'll collect a lot of information, so you'll need to record it in an organised way. I'd recommend that you use an ancestor chart, uh, like this one here. <laughs> Can you all see? Yeah. Ancestor charts act like maps. They link four or five generations in a family tree, so they're very convenient, and they don't cost anything. You can get as many as you like, you just download them free from the internet. Then you fill them out as you go along, and for each individual you record all the key information next to their full name. <laughs> it's very convenient. Now, at this point, I'd just like to give you a couple of tips about filling in the ancestor sheet. First of all, I'd advise you to use pencil, at least until you have definite evidence for the information you're recording. Secondly, as well as recording official names, I mean given names, it's worth writing any nicknames down. You know, these are the short names that people call you when they know you very well and you can show them by using quotation marks. That's ancestor charts, then. They really do save a lot of work. Now, before I show you how to go about confirming the information you've collected... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones.
You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you are away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them. And it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education, as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance, and from there to send data directly to a computer so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones, 
is an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell. That is the end of part four.